Thank you, Jim. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this Revolution Media Call. I'm very excited about the event. There's some great matches on the card uh, that have been building for a long time and I'm really looking forward to personally, and I hope you are as well. Uh, really excited to talk to you about the event today. I know there's a lot of things happening in the world of wrestling, including in AEW and outside AEW. Uh, very briefly today, one year ago today, uh, on the Go Home Dynamite, fittingly enough, also on the road to Revolution, it was at Daly's Place that I made the announcement that I purchased Ring of Honor, and now one year later exactly, a new era of honor is beginning tonight for ROH, and also we have uh, some exciting matches planned for Rampage on Friday, but uh, for us the main event coming up on Sunday is Revolution, and I'm very excited to talk to you about it. And Jim, if you want to start with the questions, we could uh, start addressing what people want to talk about. All right, fantastic. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to start with Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. And then after Brandon, we're going to go to John Alba from Fight. So Brandon, you're leading us off today. Hi, Tony. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Brandon. Great to hear from you. So my understanding of your TV deal with Warner Brothers Discovery is that the network has a one-year option to extend the deal through December 2024. I just wanted, wanted to ask if, if I'm accurate on those details, and if so, has WBD already picked up the one-year option? It's a, a fair question to ask. I have avoided commenting on the specifics of our TV deal for legal reasons. It's not because I don't like answering people's questions or because I'm not a fun guy. It's because uh, I am responsible for the jobs and livelihoods and of a lot of people and their families. And in this case, I am not supposed to answer questions about the contract that we have or the media rights contract. We have a great partnership with Warner Brothers Discovery. And uh, I just don't want to uh, circumvent or violate uh, those covenants, if that makes sense. I also feel terrible that uh, I'm already no commenting on the lead off question, Brandon. Do you have any follow up or anything else you want to ask before I move on? Sure, I have a second one. Um, could could sure. you explain to us uh, your, your strategy around house shows? Do, do you think house shows can be run profitably? And, and if not, what are the benefits that, that offset the costs? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the work you do, and I really appreciate you asking a question I can answer. Uh, yes, I have a lot of thoughts on that. When we launched, we had a much smaller roster, and what we've done is the business model from the beginning is that we are a TV wrestling promotion. And the bulk of the revenue and the vast majority of the dates here will be filled by TV wrestling or streaming or pay-per-view specials. And with the rosters expanded, we have more availability, more dates on people. And also, I do believe there's the ability to run house shows profitably. But I do think it's very, very challenging to make money on a house show, as we're seeing. And that's why we're learning the economics of it. We're trying to build that division up slowly to where we can do regular house shows and do more of them. But right now, it's kind of a stick and move situation. We're uh, in the process of developing more house shows to follow up on house rules in Ohio on March 18th in Troy, Ohio. We're all excited about that, and we're benchmarking that. I think by giving ourselves some downside protection in terms of having some built-in revenue on these shows, it's our best opportunity to lock in profitability and guarantee those will be worthwhile events. And there's a, a, a lot of people that want to work on them. Um, there's people I've never asked to work on them that are already asking what's going on with them. So those probably won't be the people I'll be chasing down as much to work them. But I have a big group of people uh, that really do want to work on them. And I think it's the kind of thing I want to utilize um, you know, to the benefit of the roster because there's so the vast majority of the roster has made it clear that this is something they do want, house shows, and most people are chasing me down that they do want to work on the house show. Uh, so I'm very excited about that, and I think as we come out of Revolution, that'll be um, something very exciting for us that, we'll, you know, we have house rules coming not long after this huge pay-per-view. Thanks very much, Brandon, for your questions. Thanks, Brandon. <clears throat> okay, as promised, I'm going to go to John Alva from Fight. And John is going to be followed by a write-in from Mike Johnson of PW Insider. John, your line is open. Thank you, Jim. Tony, always great to chat with you, especially before the pay-per-view here. 
Uh, last night, you guys had a, a really intense segment to end the show between MJF and Brian Danielson. And I, I'm someone who regularly follows Brandon Thurston's breakdowns of AEW television. And show structure has always been something I've been very fascinated in. I would love to know what your philosophy is in putting these shows together, especially in the lead up to a pay-per-view. Uh, this was one of the very few times in the last month or so that Brian Danielson or MJF were actually in the main event segment. So how do you go about setting that structure for your shows, especially leading into a big blow off at the pay-per-view? It's a great question. Uh, and it has been a mixture of trying to feature all of the prominent stories, most or many of which are featured in this pay-per-view revolution on Sunday. And in doing so, trying to slot things in the show in a way that would do a favorable TV rating and taking what has happened in prior weeks, trying to learn from that and do a better job the following week. I know that last week was the best we've done in a very long time on ratings and one of our real high benchmark results, I really believe. I think it was tremendous for us to have not only our best audience, our biggest audience and our biggest number in the 18 to 49 demographic of all of 2023, but also our, it was our biggest audience since the three year anniversary show of Dynamite on uh, October uh, 5th, I believe and also the highest number in the key 18 to 49 rating demographic that we've had since AEW Grand Slam on September 21st. Those are two of the most important shows on the annual calendar. And last week was a great episode, but it was also, uh, some people thought it wasn't the most stacked up card of main event matches. It wasn't uh, a special super card edition necessarily. It was a, a, a strong card, I thought and strong stories and i thought it showed that a lot of what we've been doing has has been working and there was a lot of interest in a number of the stories including mjf and brian danielson a lot of their stuff has been in uh prominent positions in the show but as you mentioned uh not not always at the end of the show and in this case leading into the pay-per-view i thought that was appropriate but also i've tried to put them in positions where they would have the best chance to get the biggest audience while balancing out what would be in the main event segments. Last week was a great example, I think, of a pretty steady ratings pattern throughout the show. Uh, we, we have a great lead-in, and we did very well last week to hold that lead-in, but also it, it led to steady results through the show. So it's a mix of trying to feature all the stories in prominent positions. A lot of times for Brian and Max, it hasn't been the main event segment. It's been uh, than that crossover around the 9 o'clock Eastern hour or at the top of the show when we have a great lead-in flow like we did for Max versus Takeshita opening the show. Um, so it, it was a very exciting, intense promo segment, and I thought it was a great way to end the show. And I've you know seen examples of our shows and other shows where there's been a great main event promo segment. Uh, it's not what we always do, but there's times where I think it can be very effective, and I thought it was very effective last night with Brian Danielson and those final words directed towards MJF ahead of the 60-minute Ironman match this Sunday on Pay-Per-View at Revolution. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. I'm going to read you a writing question from Mike Johnson from PW Insider. I'm going to ask Chris Mueller from Bleacher Report to be ready after Tony replies to this question from Mike, inspired by uh, Revolution. His question, Tony, we just hit the three-year anniversary of Revolution 2020 in Chicago, which was the last AW pay-per-view before the pandemic took hold. Looking back on that night, what are the lessons you think you and the company have learned that inform how you promote, book, and present major events now, like Revolution in a couple of days from now? It was one of the most important events we've ever done. I learned a lot from it, and a lot in wrestling has changed, and I'm really glad this question came up. That I think I would, I'll note for the record that this is a question I was asked, not things I brought up. That is one of my favorite events. I think it's probably my favorite pay-per-view event we've ever done. The way the card came together is very interesting, and I'd like to go back and note, I don't have it all in front of me, but I do remember these things very well, when some of these things came together, and I think there's some fuzzy memories of some of these things, because... Uh, there were some things on the card 
that came together earlier and my philosophy going into that, and I think it was very well received at the time, and now it's been exactly three years, and it's interesting because a lot's changed in the world, and I, and I, I would just go back and remind people that the way some of these things came together. John Moxley versus Chris Jericho for the World Championship had a long build. Uh, it really had kind of hinted at the end of 2019 we'd go in that direction, but it really picked up at January 1st. And they had months of build going into that event. And, uh, of course, there was the idea that John Moxley had been offered the spot in the inner circle. He turned that down and then went to war with Chris Jericho. And at the time, the inner circle, that was a great story and a great uh, main event program. A lot of the other matches uh, came together as we got closer to the event. And I thought that made for a very exciting television visit to the event. But I think there's some perception that maybe all the matches were made weeks and weeks in advance. And it's simply not the case. And I thought it led to just as exciting an event as we've ever had. And Jericho and Moxley had months of build as the world title match. In this case, has had months of build as MJF versus uh, MJF versus the American Dragon. Brian Danielson for the world championship is something that we had started to develop late last year and has been building up for months as a huge world championship program. And I'm every bit as excited for that. And in addition, we have right now John Moxley versus Hangman Page, which is a story that really goes back even further to Hangman Page winning uh, the Grand Slam Golden Ticket Battle Royale at Arthur Ashe Stadium in September and taking a shot at the World Championship in Cincinnati against John Moxley in his hometown in what became one of the most real-life scary situations we've ever had at AEW. We were all very concerned when Hangman got knocked out and had to go to the hospital that night. And I'll never forget going to, to talk to Hangman that night and just being so relieved and seeing him smiling and that he was okay, uh, you know, given how scared we were when we stretched him out of there. And to think now, here we are, this thing's come full circle. It's one of the most exciting programs in wrestling. I thought that last week to John, I'm sorry to go back to your question, John Alba, I'm not, I'm not answering that question now, but, you know, in the last week, the main event segment, uh, as I think about it, answering your previous question. We had MJF and uh, Brian Danielson this week in an exciting segment. I really liked how we closed the show last week also to address the John Moxley versus Hangman Page program, which is, again, something that's been building for months. I would equate those two programs at the time as the, the key programs that had months of development that the shows had largely been built around. It, it, was, it was a similar situation there where, uh, you know, you had, you, uh, at the time, you had, John Moxley versus Chris Jericho and Cody Rhodes versus MJF were programs that had months of build behind them and I think were really red hot going into the pay-per-view and I felt that way, uh, you know, these past few weeks about MJF versus Brian Danielson in the 60-minute Ironman match for the World Championship and about John Moxley versus Hangman Page for the World Championship. Other great matches on the show did not come together until the last two weeks and it was actually the week before the pay-per-view in Atlanta where the Young Bucks won the Tag Team Battle Royale, to confirm Young Bucks versus Kenny and Hangman. And we only had one week of real TV getting into it, but it was obviously a story that people knew was coming for a long time. With the tag teams going into uh, the full tag team four-way now, this year it's a little bit different because, yes, again, it's coming together uh, close to the event, but similar to Young Bucks and, versus Hangman and Kenny. It's a very, very different kind of wrestling match. I'm not trying to compare it at all. It was two babyface teams that had a lot of history with each other. This is completely different because you have arguably four of the most popular wrestlers in AEW with the acclaimed and Orange Cassidy and Danhausen and the Guns and Jarrett and Lethal. And it, it'll be a completely different match. I'm not saying it, it'll be the same thing or, or it's, it's apples and oranges, completely different situation. But the two World Tag Team Championship programs – it, they were both kind of things that, that were developing on TV and had stakes that were still in play up until the final weeks. Uh, you had Darby Allen made his return in Atlanta the week before the pay-per-view. So that is another match that got announced the week before the pay-per-view, about 10 days out, and people had been really waiting, and that, that was the right time to bring Darby back for the biggest pop following the John Moxley-Jeff Cobb match. I would also like to note that I'm doing all this off the top of my head right now. And uh, the John Moxley versus Jeff Cobb match, uh, after that, there was the attack from Chris Jericho. We turned the lights out. Darby came back for his uh, match against Sammy, which, again, got announced pretty close to the pay-per-view. 
Then there's one of the most memorable matches on the show, and I think one of the most memorable and commercially successful matches in AEW history, a clip that is still monetized to this day, Orange Cassidy versus Pac in the debut of Orange Cassidy. We actually announced that match a couple days before the pay-per-view when Orange Cassidy came out and taunted Pac after the, ironically, the Iron Man match against Kenny Omega. And, uh, you know, so it was there were some of the things coming together on the weeks leading into the television that were the perfect timing. There were some of the things that had been building for months that people were excited about, and I think that's a winning formula. And I've tried as best I can. You know, I don't have, I always say I don't have a time machine, so I can't go back and change the things that I would change, or I would change things every single day of my life. But I do think there's matches on top that people are really, really excited about on this show, and uh, I'm very excited for it myself. But we've seen some of the matches uh, that have come together a little bit closer to the pay-per-view and some of the things that have been building for months. And I thought that was a, a formula that worked very well then. And I remember at the time people were saying, like, oh, they're just announcing this right before the pay-per-view. But then the pay-per-view happened and people absolutely loved it. And now people look back and say it's one of their favorite builds. And I do think there's been a lot of shows in the last several weeks, really in the, since the start of 2023, there's been a number of shows more more super positive reviews than anything else where most of the shows we've done this year have been amongst uh, the favorite shows of, of several people. You know, there's, there's been a couple shows where people had questions or, or there was a thing or two they didn't like, but for the most part in 2023, most of our events have been really well received on television. So I think it's been very positive. I think um, uh, overall that 2020 revolution build was one of the most informative and important uh, times in the history of the company, and I take from it. I try to learn from it all the time, and for me, I think that was probably my favorite pay-per-view at the time we've ever done, and of course, it was challenging to go into the pandemic after that, but now it's great to be back on the road every single week, and, and certainly that event in Chicago three years ago today, uh, or three years ago yesterday, I guess, um, would mark one of the most important nights in AEW history. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Chris Wheeler from uh, Bleacher Report, you are next. I'd like to ask Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy to be ready after Chris. Chris, go. Hi, Tony. Uh, so with ROH relaunching tonight, one thing I noticed is that the Revolution card does not include any Ring of Honor title matches as of right now. So moving forward, are you planning on drawing a clearer line between Ring of Honor and AEW, or can we still expect to see a fair amount of crossover on both shows? It's a good question, but I don't think there's been any crossover since Final Battle. And to be fair, I think there's people here that were not on my Final Battle media call, but I made it pretty clear going into Final Battle that, that some of the wrestlers who are featured in each company would cross over, but really that as far as Ring of Honor championships and Ring of Honor stories being featured on AEW, the goal was for that to go through final battle, and then I wouldn't really be doing much of that, and then those things would be moving uh, to the Ring of Honor platforms. There was a transitional period where there have been a number of Ring of Honor championship defenses on AEW Dark and Elevation in recent months. There have been virtually none on AEW television since... Claudio versus Jericho, and that program ended because I think the Ocho, there were a lot of great matches in the Ocho with Chris Jericho, and that was an important thing for us to feature in AEW at the time, I felt. And there was, you know, whether it was Jericho versus Ishii, Jericho versus Bandito, there were, and Jericho versus Danielson, there were a number of times where those were important matches to AEW's TV. Uh, but then coming out of Final Battle, I had said that we would not be um, crossing the streams as much anymore. Uh, and as of tonight with the launch of the Ring of Honor TV, I think now there's a, a platform for the ROH championships and stories, and it should be a very exciting night tonight. We've gotten really positive reviews from the live fans who attended the tapings, and I think if, if there's anybody that hasn't heard this, I, I would strongly encourage them to check out the Ring of Honor debut as a new era of honor begins tonight. Uh, but, yeah, just so you know, that's something I have been trying to do for months, and, and I think a lot of people have taken taken notice of it, and it's been mostly received pretty positively, and um, that's why it's been that way for a couple months. Thanks, man. Okay. Uh, a, um, Amy, uh, Amy Nebedee from Russell Joy, you're up next, and after that I'm going to follow Amy with a write-in from Max Ebert. 
from Sports Kingdom. Amy? Great. Hi, Tony Khan. It's great to talk to you. Hey. So I wanted to talk about the Women's Triple Threat Championship match at Revolution. We have Jamie Hayter, who's an incredible fighting champion, banger matches, crowd loves her. Soraya, she's a pioneer of women's wrestling, the whole evolution that came from that. And Ruby Soho, who's beloved across her entire career, one of the best entrances in wrestling, her iconic street fight moment. Everybody's coming into this match on a huge high, especially in AEW. I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on each of the competitors, as well as how they represent the locker room in this AEW Originals slash the Outsiders, so to speak, divide. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. And I'm looking forward to the three-way match for the Women's World Championship this Sunday on pay-per-view at AEW Revolution. I think, as you said, each of them represents uh, a very different history in pro wrestling and in particular in AEW, and each of them has a very different perception among the locker room. I'm probably not the best person to speak of how people are perceived in the locker room, but I can speak to what I know to be a fact and what I think. Um, Jamie Hayter has been with us since the first year of AEW, and since 2019, she's developed into such an amazing pro wrestler. She's grown, and she's become very popular with the crowds, and she has become one of the world's top wrestlers. And it's been amazing to watch that transformation take place on AEW television. Some of that transformation took place away from AEW television, frankly. She came back after the pandemic as a completely different performer and a completely different, with a very different look and being able to do some different things in the ring and in the presentation of Jamie Hader. So I believe Jamie Hader is a, a very important wrestler in AEW and a great champion who is capable of having great matches and has a great connection with our audience. Ruby Soho has been here for a long time. She hasn't been here the whole time, but I think she's been here for, you know, roughly half of the, of the length of AEW, which is why it's fitting that I think she's in the middle of this thing because She's worked with Soraya and Soraya's friends in the past, so she does have a closer relationship to them than a lot of our locker room would and knows them well and also has a close relationship to our locker room and knows them a lot better than somebody who just walked in off the street like Soraya. And uh, Ruby Soho is also a great wrestler. As you mentioned in the lead-up question, I think it was a great point. Ruby Soho has a great reputation as a brawler also and had a great moment this year in that great street fight teaming with Willow Nightingale to defeat Ty Mello and Anna Jay, who are also noted street fight enthusiasts. And uh, I thought that was a great match. And um, Ruby Soho is having a great year. And he's picked up some really big wins in AEW this year and is certainly a, a very worthy top contender. You have Soraya on the other end of this spectrum who has come into AEW as a big-name free agent and has gotten a great platform. I personally like Soraya a lot. I think a lot of the lifeblood day one AEW fans did not take kindly to the way Soraya tried to endear herself to the crowd. And to be fair, that's one of the things that happens in AEW when people have the chance to uh, use their own words, because I think we had good talks about bullet points and about building up Soraya versus Britt Baker, but I believe some of the things in uh, the lead-up to that match that Soraya said really endeared the fans to Britt more than her, and because these are fans that have been with AEW from day one and probably didn't agree with her perception and her perspective on the company when she arrived, but I also think that helped me uh, find a way to utilize everybody in what can be an exciting program for them and what I hope will be a great match for all three women on this huge pay-per-view card and it's, it's one of the biggest events in our history and there's so much great wrestling on this show and I think this match fits like a glove. I'm very excited for it. It's been building up for a long time also and uh, I really look forward to this three-way match. I have a lot of respect for all three women. I think they all have different wrestling styles, and they all have different histories in the wrestling business, and especially here with their times 
and experiences in AEW, and I think all of that will make for a very interesting match and hopefully a great match this Sunday at Revolution. Thanks for the great question. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> okay, as promised, I'm, I've got a write-in question here from Max Everett from Sports Kita. Uh, John Orchiola from Screen Rant, you will be after Tony addresses the following question from Max, and that is, um, how did booking a 60-minute Ironman match on this weekend's Revolution card impact booking the rest of the card and perhaps even last night's Dynamite? What a great question. It uh, is the longest bell to bell match we've ever planned to feature on pay-per-view. Uh, we've never allocated this much time to any one match. I think the uh, there's been a couple times I've allocated uh, a, a good amount of time to a match, but never uh, this what you have to do for a 60-minute Ironman match. So in terms of formatting the pay-per-view, it is a bit different. It's less matches than we've done on some of our pay-per-views, but I think it will be a great event, and uh, there will be a lot of time for the main event, to say the least, but there will also be a lot of great matches on tap for this card that I think people are really looking forward to. I didn't do as many matches on the pay-per-view card as I normally might have, but I also uh, think we have as much exciting stories or TV as ever, and to your great question about how that affected last night's show, we saw that the Face of the Revolution ladder match, which has been featured the past few years at the Revolution pay-per-view card, I thought the best chance to get that involved and utilize that IP and utilize that, that, that match that fans enjoy and give a great wrestler like Powerhouse Hobbs, in this case, an opportunity to get a big win in their hometown, no less, and now have an opportunity to challenge for the TNT Championship on AEW Dynamite. I thought the best way to feature that match and give it time and an opportunity, and I thought it was a great match last night and one of the several great things on last night's show on TBS that it was uh, made sense to do that on Dynamite because, you know, with, with the duration of the 60-minute Ironman match, we wouldn't be able to do as much bell-to-bell -bell wrestling in the other matches as we might normally do on a pay-per-view card. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> okay, John Orchiola from Screen Rant. You are next, and John will be followed by another John, John Pollock from Post Wrestling. John? John, you're muted. John, you need to unmute your line. Robin, can we go to John Pollock in the meantime? John, if you're ready, John Pollock, and we can try John Rokiola after that. Available? Oh, so, sorry. This is John Pearson, but I, I can ask my question if you want. Jo John, who are you with? Uh, this is, uh, I'm with Triple Threat, not Screen Rant. Go ahead and proceed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Tony, for uh, taking my question here. Um, It is on uh, Ricky Punks. Uh, Ricky has been placed in some pretty big programs as of late, uh, and it seems like his star power, both in the company and online, is growing. What kind of confidence do you have for him to be one of the figureheads of the company going forward? I think Ricky Starks is a great wrestler. I've uh, had a great feeling about him since he arrived in AEW, and I really enjoy working with him. And he's had some big wins, and he's had some great moments in AEW in the past several months. I thought he ended 2022 on a real high note with a great match against MJF at AEW Winter is Coming for the World Championship. And he's had great showings in uh, several matches, including the very first match in AEW in 2023 in Seattle versus Chris Jericho. And I think Ricky Starks has all the potential in the world, but he's also right now one of the best wrestlers, and that's what uh, makes him such uh, an exciting person to invest television time in when you have somebody that is 
already great and is already um, a featured prominent part of AEW, but also somebody that we believe can get even better and do even more here in AEW. And I think he's got a great opportunity. And the person he's facing is the person who's probably done the most of anyone here, which is Chris Jericho, who has over 30 years of experience in pro wrestling at a high level and has won championships all over the world, is arguably the most decorated champion in wrestling today in terms of all the championships he's won, which was one of the reasons I thought it would be very cool to do the Ocho and to really highlight all of Chris's accomplishments and championships. And it was one of the few ways I could think to add another uh, world championship that has that kind of great history to Chris's legendary, unprecedented resume. And I think Chris Jericho has taken a lot of interest in Ricky Starks also. uh, And frankly, this match will be very interesting. I think it's another program that has had a lot of anticipation and months of build towards it. And hopefully people will really enjoy that match. This Sunday at Revolution, Jericho versus Ricky Starks, it's a, it's a great opportunity. Frankly, it's a great opportunity for anybody, anytime they get uh, out there and wrestle on a pay-per-view event like AEW Revolution. But I do think, in particular, for a great young wrestler like Ricky Starks, where the sky's the limit, uh, it's a great opportunity for him this Sunday at, at Revolution. Thank you, John. Um, John Okiolo, we're going to try you again. Are you there? Here. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Sorry about that. Hi, Tony. Good to talk to you again. Hey, good to talk to you. Yeah. Um, so more and more AEW has crossed over into mainstream entertainment. And you know, as a fan, it's really awesome to see. Like I know Britt Baker is a he's a big fan of Cobra Kai. She went to the season five premiere. I know Anthony Bowens is a huge fan of The Last of Us. Um, are AEW wrestlers free to take side projects, acting in movies and TV shows, and are there any in the works? We work with the wrestlers in AEW uh, anytime they have a big opportunity. If people come to us and say this is going to be good for us, and, and even if it, it doesn't even have to be great for the company, as long as it's not going to hurt the company, <laughs> if it's going to be good for them, I want people to have these opportunities and take advantage of them. And I want a happy roster, and as long as it's not going to hurt AEW, I want to try and facilitate that. So when people have opportunities in film, television, or other media, if it's not going to affect the storylines of the TV in a major detrimental way, then, of course, we always want to try and accommodate some things when possible. And we've had people come into AEW, and that was one of the reasons they really wanted to come here is there are other opportunities in wrestling they weren't given uh, that kind of freedom for outside projects when they're not working on TV for us. So I think that's a great question, and I think that's one of the things where we've set ourselves apart as being a very accommodating place to come and wrestle. Thank you. Um, Tony, I've got a write-in here uh, from Joey Hayden from the Dallas Morning News I'm going to read to you, and then after, after I do that, Trevor Robb from the Edmonton Journal will follow. Joey Hayden from the Dallas Morning News asks, was there any thought to work Adam Cole back into the mix ahead of the Revolution pay-per-view, or did his recovery more accurately align to be his comeback match to the debut of All Access? Jim, can you ask that one more time? Sorry, my phone cut out mid-question for a second. Can you please, I want to make sure I didn't miss any thoughts. Thanks. Joey wants to know, was there any thought to working in Adam Cole into the mix ahead of the Revolution pay-per-view, or did his recovery sort of, was it a better fit for his comeback match uh, to the debut of of the all-access program? There are a number of factors that played into that decision, but I think it's going to be very exciting here this month to have Adam Cole, one of our biggest stars, back in the ring. We're going to feature that story very prominently in AEW All Access, which is coming up this month, following AEW Dynamite on TBS. Immediately after the show, it will be a a weekly 60-minute series. And the night the show premieres will also be the night Adam Cole returns to the ring. And then 
you'll be able to watch uh, the start of that journey back to wrestling for him. And each week after Dynamite, we'll be following some wrestlers from AEW, some of the key people backstage. And Adam Cole is one of those people, and we'll follow the road to his comeback, including his, his life at home, at home with Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, and also with his family and so many of the challenges that went into this comeback that we're all looking forward to. Um, certainly also would be something great for the pay-per-view, I think, uh, which is what we're all completely focused on. But I think in terms of giving him the most amount of time to recover, the most amount of attention to the match, and also uh, as a cross-promotional opportunity with a new series that we're very excited about with AEW All Access for a number of reasons. Everybody, including uh, our partners at Warner Brothers Discovery, TBS, and TNT, I think everyone agreed that uh, for Dynamite on TBS and for All Access on TBS and the symmetry of the story uh, and the nature of the comeback that these things would all do very well, hopefully packaged together on TBS. Okay, thanks, Tony. Thanks for that question, Joey. Trevor Robb from the Edmonton Journal, you are next. Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT, I'd like for you to be ready after Trevor and Tony chat. Trevor? Hey, Tony, thanks so much for taking the, taking the time and asking or answering my question. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the uh, the style and the presentation of AEW because it has gone uh, had a bit of a makeover here of late. You had a new uh, entrance uh, starting at the year. You have new uh, videotrons and uh, and graphics. We saw now with Ring of Honor restarting that there's a new presentation that's now uh, filtering over to Dark as well. I'm not sure if we're going to see a custom uh, set for Revolution here on Sunday, but I'm just wondering, I guess, how you balance that desire to want to revitalize and maybe freshen up the look of AEW while also maintaining that core AEW vibe? Well, it, at the start of 2023, we wanted to update our look on TV and streaming. And so our arena set and some of the graphics packages were updated with a new look. And I think it's been very well received. And I think it was a, a good change for us. And I really like the new look. Uh, in addition, our set at Universal Studios and our digital look where we've got uh, AEW Dark filming and also where Ring of Honor's weekly series is now filmed, that uh, was an important project for us, and I think that was very successful. The, the crew did a great job updating that look and adding seating capacity, but also uh, improving the look with new video signage and uh, updated just an updated look of, of that presentation that I think has been very very good so uh, it's it's something that we don't want to make those kind of changes um, constantly and 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 do want to settle on a look and want to um, keep the look of aew consistent but also um, find ways to freshen up the presentation when we can so I think this year um, those changes have mostly been well received, so that's uh, that's a good sign that we'll stick with them. Thanks, and uh, I think, in in general, though, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, it's the kind of thing we can uh, um, plan to plan to follow. And I don't I don't think there's a set time for the next time we would make changes, but I think you know this was a, a great refresh, and and now we have a a great look for 2023. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Samantha Shipman from the Daily DDT is next, and Samantha will be followed by Stu Myrick from 104.9 in Austin, Texas. Samantha? Hi, Tony. Hi. Uh, good to talk to you again. Um, I have a question, kind of going back to All Access. When that was announced, it reminded me of last summer there was a trademark for all elite women um, but then we never really heard anything else about that was that supposed to have been a tv show or can you tell us a little bit about maybe what the plan for that was going to be and what happened to that is that something you still are going to pursue yeah i would love to have that show be a show that gets picked up i think it is an idea i had for a show and it's something i would love to do 
is uh, all elite women, and that's why I filed the trademark because I think it's a good idea. And we have a great women's roster, and I, I love to utilize them as much as possible. And uh, anytime we can develop more programming to feature our roster, I think it's something that is a great opportunity for the company and for the wrestlers. And in the case of the women's locker room, I think there's a, a number of really deserving talent in there, and there's people we feature on TV regularly, and there's there's even more people I'd like to feature more. So uh, that was the idea behind all elite women. That's still an idea I think would be a great thing if it ever gets picked up. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Samantha. Stu Myrick from 104.9 in Austin is next, and I will follow Stu with a write-in question from Ella J from a wrestling gal. Stu? Great. Tony, uh, thanks for the time. It was great to see you during Super Bowl week in Phoenix. Uh, someone that looks like won't be involved in Revolution, Eddie Kingston, who uh, on AEW social media seemingly quit. Uh, have you talked to Eddie since last night? Uh, can you address this in any form or fashion? Yeah, I have talked to Eddie since last night, and I would encourage people to stay tuned to pro wrestling, stay tuned to AEW and uh, other forms of pro wrestling. Of course, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the sport, uh, in AEW, and also in our uh, metaverse of pro wrestling, uh, including New Japan, and of course, tonight, the launch of the new Ring of Honor. So a lot of exciting things happening, and uh, I have had a chance to talk to Eddie about that, and I'd say stay tuned. Uh, to the wrestling business, and then you'll see what happens next. <laughs> Thanks, Stu. Okay, Stu, we appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, here's the, um, the question from Ella J from uh, a wrestling gal, and, and Ella will be followed by Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone. Ella has this question for you, Tony. AEW Revolution will hold the first 60-minute iron match in company history. Why do you feel that now is the time to have this type of match? Well, I think it's a the right time and it's the right match. MJF versus the American Dragon Brian Danielson in a 60-minute Ironman match for the AEW World Championship this Sunday at Revolution because it is the ultimate test of a pro wrestler's stamina, their strength, conditioning, and their creativity. And I think these are two wrestlers that have all of the physical and all of the mental tools to put together an incredible 60-minute Ironman match. And I think it's something that for the fans of pro wrestling, this is a great, this is a great pay-per-view main event in my mind because you know you're going to get this value. AEW is going to deliver the match. You know it's good. we're gonna we're gonna put the time into it, and you know that uh, frankly, if this match, uh, I, for months and months, I think people would love to see any kind of Brian Danielson versus MJF match. The story has been building, and I think a one on one one fall match would be very exciting, and I think people would really look forward to it, and it would be a great pay per view event. I think it adds that much more to this as a hook, knowing that it's going to be a 60-minute Ironman match. We've never had a 60-minute Ironman match before. And, you know, the first 30-minute Ironman match I referenced earlier on the call was on the road to Revolution, actually on the go-home television in Kansas City three years ago this week. And uh, that was an amazing match. And to think that we're going to go twice as long in this match it is – crazy to think and i thought that was a great value for the fans uh, to get that match on tv you don't normally get things like that on tv at least you didn't when we launched and now there's so much great wrestling uh largely uh on AEW tv every week and i believe uh the nature of the match the duration the rules the structure and the format it all lends itself to a classic, and I believe MJF and Brian Danielson are capable of having that classic match, and over the months 
since Brian Danielson won the championship under, excuse, excuse me, since MJF won the championship under questionable circumstances at full gear, uh, utilizing Brian Danielson's mentor, uh, Lord William Regal, in his pursuits, and then cast Lord Regal aside, I think the story has continued to build, and now it's become such a personal and intense rivalry between the two men that I personally cannot wait to see them share the ring, and the thought of them sharing the ring for 60 minutes this Sunday gets me very excited as a wrestling fan. So that was the idea behind it, and hopefully it's getting people excited as we get towards the pay-per-view. It seems like a lot of people are looking forward to it. Thanks for the great question. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Ella. We've got about 10 minutes to go, so let's do a little lightning round here. We're going to try to get three or four more in. Uh, Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone, you are next, and we're going to follow Bill with Will, Will Washington from Grab City. Go, Bill. Bill, we can't hear you if you're asking a question. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Hello? Bill, can you hear us? Why don't we uh, go to Will and then we'll revisit Bill. Will Washington, are you ready? Yes, I am. Tony, can you hear me? Hey, Will. I can. Hey, hey thanks for taking my question. Uh, so, talking about the card, there's currently eight matches booked in official capacity on the card, um, which is, uh, at the moment, one of the smaller cards that you've ever put on on pay-per-view. Obviously, the 60-minute Iron Man match plays a big factor in that. Uh, do you foresee, with Rampage coming up, any other matches being added? We uh, noticed that, of course, the TBS title isn't being defended this time around. You had a program being built between Swear Strickland and Keith Lee that doesn't have a match on here yet. Do you anticipate ant adding any more matches to the card as, the, uh, as we get closer, or do you think it's pretty set with the eight? I think it's fairly set. I think there's some circumstances around Jungle Boy and Christian and clarifying uh, what uh, is to come between the two men in this fight that they want to have. Uh, but, uh, you know, Christian had been out injured for until a couple weeks ago and, and made his return to TV. And uh, there were so many hot things happening leading into Revolution, and that added some fuel to the fire, we thought. Uh, it was a great promo last night by Christian, I thought, and got people excited for that. So that's a, uh, a situation in flux, as I mentioned, uh, in the original Revolution in 2020, a lot of matches that had months of anticipation and build and then some exciting things that came together in the final few weeks that made uh, the, the go-home TVs that much more exciting. And uh, I think with the 60-minute Ironman match on the card, it would be challenging to get more matches on the main pay-per-view card. But I do think uh, there is potential... Uh, you know, we, we, we still haven't announced uh, anything for the pre-show. There's, there's, there's still potential there, but I do think, um, in general, the eight matches on the pay-per-view card, given the 60-minute Ironman match, makes sense uh, in the formatting. So that's probably what we'll end up with, uh, is my instinct. Thanks for asking, Will. It's a great question. And um, I know that, I, you know, I think people should still tune into Rampage because there will be... Um, there will be impact on the event this weekend from tomorrow's show. But as far as uh, beefing it up and adding a completely new match to the card or adding anything in, I think uh, that would be a challenge uh, to the timing. And, and I want to make sure all the matches have a good amount of time to have great matches. And, um, you know, it seems to be overall by the fans uh, pretty well received um, because I think uh, – Everybody wants to make sure that all those matches have, uh, you know, good good time and that we still have plenty of time allocated for the 60-minute Ironman match for the World Championship. Thanks for asking, Will. 
Thanks, Will. <clears throat> We're going to try Bill Pritchard again. Uh, so Bill, be ready here. And then I'm going to follow Bill with a write-in from Corey Smith of City Wrestling Radio. Bill, you there? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, we can. Oh, okay, perfect. Good afternoon, Tony. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good now that I got on and worked out my tech issues. <laughs> good. good. Uh, What's your so, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, you were on the Baby Huey show talking about how, and this kind of goes along with Will's question, how, about how you weren't going to try to stuff too much into the Revolution card because of the Iron Man match. But um, how do you feel about the perception that uh, your pay-per-view cards are running too long? And I want, before you answer, uh, note that most of the original cards for a, a few years had single digit match counts on them it really wasn't until the past few months that it started to go over double digits so and this is sitting at eight right now so how do you kind of feel about that perception that the the cards are running too long or you're, you're trying to put too many matches on one show well the cards have been other than double or nothing 2022 because that was a unique situation with the nba having a game seven on the night of our pay-per-view that we, you know, we didn't know that series was going to go seven games. And it's very unlikely in general that series do go seven games. Um, so uh, I planned a little bit differently and put a lot of the meat of the card right after the game. And that did seem to serve us well because that was the most in-show late buys we've ever done for a pay-per-view. And so I do think that was an effective business strategy. And on the West Coast, certainly it didn't hurt the energy of the show at all because the energy – for the last three matches was probably the best energy in the entire show uh, for Anarchy in the Arena, the World Tag Team Championship match, and the World Championship match. And I think the duration has been the same for all of them. I believe we've done about 16 shows, and they've all been the same length except for one. Now, in terms of the number of matches that we've played with a little bit, uh, but we've always had long matches and a lot of stuff on the pay-per-views, I think... Um, this is a good number in terms of letting the matches breathe, but this also is a little unique with eight matches in that it ensures that uh, it ensures that we'll have the appropriate amount of time for what will be a historic main event, something that's really unprecedented here in AEW. We've never tried, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. It seems like it's been very well received by the fans, and I understand. I would love to get. Um, you know, as many wrestlers as possible on the pay-per-view card, but obviously there has to be a balance, and it seems like it's for this Sunday it's been very well received by the fans. Okay, Tony, thank you. And this is going to take us right up to the hour, so we're going to we're going to finish, I believe, here with Corey Smith from City Wrestling Radio, um, and it's an appropriate question, Tony, um, uh, for the occasion. What were the what was some of the deciding factors to bring AEW Revolution to San Francisco and the Chase Center? Uh, or, what a great question! Um, well, we the Chase Center is one of the best events in. Uh, excuse me, the Chase. Excuse me, Revolution is one of our biggest events, and the Chase Center is one of the best arenas in the country. And the Bay Area is one of the top markets. It made a lot of sense. When there was availability at the Chase Center on the weekend and to be able to bring AEW Dynamite last night and AEW Rampage tomorrow night to the historic Cow Palace, we were just very excited about this opportunity. It's a really important market for us. It's been a great TV market for AEW, and there's so many fans in the Bay Area, and that's why we wanted to bring this big event, this big week here to San Francisco and the surrounding areas. And the Chase Center. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a newer arena. It, it was best in class basketball arena, and it's uh, a great venue for us for a pay per view. So we've been looking forward to coming and making our debut in the Bay Area for a long time, and this felt like uh, the right timing and the right event to bring. All right, Tony. <clears throat> Tony, we about. 20 or 30 seconds. Do you have any, any closing thoughts for everybody here? Well, thanks for asking, Jim. Uh, I am very excited for this pay-per-view event. I really appreciate all of you 
joining us today and giving me the chance to answer your questions. I'm sorry to anybody who didn't get to ask anything. If you're going to be at the pay-per-view event or if you can send a write-in, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can or all of your questions if possible after the Revolution card in the scrum. Uh, I really cannot say enough how much I appreciate you and all of what you do um, on an individual basis. I enjoy interacting with you. Uh, try to do media between pay-per-view events and then I'll, obviously it, it's a crazy uh, uh, run-up and, and we're all huddled up together like this talking about the event, but um, I look forward to working with each of you hopefully in the future, and I, I just can't thank you enough for covering this. Hopefully see a lot of you in person on Sunday at Revolution. Uh, I'm just so excited for the event, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about AEW Revolution today. Uh, Jim, thanks for moderating it, and uh, I think that's probably about all I had to add, unless, Jim, you wanted to add anything else. No, really, that's it, Tony. I appreciate your time. We all do. And to everybody that joined us, um, you know, thanks again. We're, we're at the end of our time, but we will be distributing an audio recording to all attendees shortly, as we always do. So be looking for that. And then we're going to be looking for you, uh, either tomorrow at the Kyle Palace for Rampage or Sunday at the Chase Center for Revolution. So if you're unable to join us in person this weekend, we trust you'll tune in. And really to everybody, our sincere thanks for your interest in AEW and and really all you do for, you know, to promote and celebrate professional wrestling. Uh, we appreciate it. Jim, 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 I thought of one thing. Can I add one note I just forgot to mention? You may. We're, we, we paid for extra time on this. We're good. Go. Let's go. Uh, well, there you go. So we're in overtime now, and I just wanted to mention to you that I thought that we had some excellent promos on last night's show, and I, I briefly mentioned when it came up about the main event segment we had uh, Brian Danielson out there, and he said some very powerful things uh, to MJF, and they've said a lot of powerful things in their promos leading up to that great match. I thought there were some great promos on last night's show, and I felt like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Hangman Page. I thought did a great promo, and in particular, I thought John Moxley did one of my personal favorite wrestling promos I've seen. I thought it was certainly one of the best promos I've seen this year and in recent years and uh, he shot it after the match for the countdown show. And I didn't mention this uh, on the call, but the countdown to Revolution will be tomorrow night immediately after AEW Rampage on TNT at 11 p.m. Uh, there'll be a lot of great videos and interviews in there. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the countdown, but also I just feel like uh, Moxley and Hangman have done so much, so much to each other and said so much to each other in the build of this Texas death match. And I just wanted to note again, if you haven't seen that promo, please uh, check it out. If you're a wrestling fan, I thought, to me, it was one of the best interviews or promos I've seen to see John Moxley bleeding on the staircase and saying the things he said. I thought it was very powerful, and that's why I wanted to feature it in a prominent position last night. I had a revolution, and, uh, you know, I just have to give uh, so much credit to them, and I, I wanted to just note that because I realized I hadn't brought it up at all in this call. Thanks, Jim.